world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'll be honest with you guys. This, it's, a, it's a very... It's one thing as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, to prepare a message when like, you got your whole kind of schedule figured out and there's a major sense of normalcy in the world. Like that's convenient, right? Like you, you kind of, you know, you can craft an illustration a little bit more intentionally, but then all of a sudden, when something like what we all just went through over the past couple of days occurs, you, you gotta be a little bit more spirit led. So my, my prayer, guys, could you just be gracious with me today and patient? As I, as I bring the word, I just, I want the spirit to do his work. Um, I want him to read this room different than he read the 9 a.m. room and make sure that he's ministering to the people in this auditorium and those online the way that he wants to. One thing that I, that I picked up this week, and I, I went to go be a part of the cleaning crew yesterday, and uh, my goodness, my goodness, can you show the pictures of some of the things that I saw personally? So here's three houses out of dozens. And a lot of you saw this. Some of you have, some of you have actually lost a home in, severely like this, whether watching online or in person today. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that really struck me as I was walking through, besides, honestly, one of the biggest blessings was seeing thousands of people Thousands from this city come with trucks and shovels and chainsaws and water bottles. And you have like really nice old ladies carrying around Runza. Like just like it's Nebraska's finest at work, guys. Like amazing. You guys, you know, if you don't know, I'm not from here originally. I'm from the D.C. area. Went to the University of Miami to study film. Don't hold that against me, Nebraska fans. Um, but God called me here, and I'll tell you what, I've never felt more at home than in Omaha, Nebraska. And I love this city, and I love what God is doing in this city, and I can tell you right now, God is not done with what he's doing. This city, there's something special about the heartland, and it's not just like a cliche. I really think it's a prophetic. It's prophetic that we are the heart of this country, and we have the ability if we tap into the right power to pump hope to the rest of this country that so desperately needs it right now. But what I noticed as I was walking through all of the destruction as a, as a, a guy who's more prophetically bent, and what's that, what does that mean? It means that, you know, I, I, my spiritual antenna is up. God's speaking to me. I'm just trying to listen to what he's saying. One of the things that was probably the most devastating things that I walked past, beyond just houses falling over and some houses completely gone, was I felt a weight in my spirit. And the weight in my spirit was this question, this demonic question. It's like I could read people's minds, I could read people's hearts, this question that was just hovering over this entire area of Elkhorn and Blair, and Bennington. And the question was, where was God? If you're taking notes, and if you're not taking notes, I would encourage you to take notes today because it's not a coincidence that you're here. The Holy Spirit brought you here today. He wants to say something to you. And my, my encouragement to you, and whether you're watching online or in person, is that you would lean in and grab whatever God wants to give you. Because God wants to give you a word today that will change everything in your life if you're willing to receive it. And here's the word, the first word I want you to write down. God is not my enemy. Can I get an amen from somebody? God is not my enemy. This is what it says in John 10, 10. Jesus said, one of my favorite scriptures, because it brings so much clarity to what's happening in the world, to all of the devastation and destruction and depression and disease and death and decay. This scripture just makes everything make so much more sense. John said, or Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief, the devil, he's the one who came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came with one MO. And his MO was to bring life 
and life to the full. Is anybody grateful that Jesus is a life giver? That Jesus is not a destroyer. Jesus came to destroy one thing, and it was to destroy the works of the devil. And as I'm praying and as I'm in worship, one of the things that the Holy Spirit downloads to me is that what we're experiencing in this city is, is more than a natural phenomenon. I really believe it's majorly in part a supernatural phenomenon. I believe that what this city has walked through and will continue to walk through will be the effects of spiritual terrorism. What do I mean by that? You see, whether you realize it or not, you and I were placed on planet Earth in the middle, we were born in the middle of a cosmic battle, of a spiritual war. And this war is not between Israel and Palestine. This war is not between conservatives and liberals, between Democrats and Republicans. This war is a spiritual war between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And this battle has been raging before the first human being stepped foot on the planet. And whether you like it or whether I like it or not, we are in this war. There's no middle ground. There's no no man's land. And there is no fence. We're going there today. We really need to. Because too many people, and if I'm not careful, I can fall in this trap. Too many of us as Christians go through life thinking that Christianity is just this, this life of Expect like we, everything falls as you would expect it to fall. Everything goes as planned. And when you give your life to Jesus, the devil just all of a sudden disappears and everything goes great in your life. Can I tell you one, a pattern that I see over and over and over and over again is for people who give their lives to Jesus, the temperature doesn't go down. The temperature rises in their life. And the reason why is because so many people are drifting through life on the enemy's team, on Satan's team, and they don't even realize it. They're just a cog in the wheel, just kind of like a zombie wandering through life. And the devil's like, I already got them on my team. They're already doing my will. I don't need to exert any energy or effort to redirect them. It's as soon as Christians wake up to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of this war, that the devil puts a target on people's backs. And I believe what the devil wants to do right now in this city, number one, he wants to keep Christians asleep to what he's up to. And what is he up to? The second point is this, that one of the devil's most dirty tricks after he steals, after he kills, after he destroys, is he whispers in your ear and says, where was God? Church, I'm, I, trust me, I love, I love that we're getting, we're rolling up our sleeves. I love that we're putting on some gloves. I love that we're helping out people practically. But we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the head and not the tail. We're above and not below. We are a city on a hill. We are supposed to be the leaders in the culture. And I can, let me tell you this. It is not enough. It is not enough for us to mirror what humanitarian efforts are doing. We need to provide a supernatural solution to what's going on in the world. I want to show you, because you might be thinking, Cap, it seems like every time you take the stage... You talk about spiritual warfare. But here's what's amazing about the book of Mark as we're reading the book of Mark. You cannot escape the reality that dealing with the demonic, dealing with devils was not an accessory to Jesus's ministry. It was foundational because Jesus was sent to set the captives free. And you and me as believers of Jesus Christ have one mission, to advance his kingdom and to help do the work of setting those captives free. You can praise God for that. Praise him and receive it, because I'll tell you what, there are people in this city that are bound, and they're not bound just in bad habits. They're not bound in an undisciplined lifestyle. There are people in this city that are being deceived by the devil, that, are, that they're, they're generationally have been robbed, killed and destroyed by him. But Jesus has sent us to go and minister to these people and not just give them the, the hope of a rebuilt house, but to give them the hope of a mansion in heaven where they can reign with Jesus, our king, and live with God's people forever. Amen. That's what we're really here to do. So today's message, we're going to talk about four secrets 
that demons don't want you to know. Because once you know them, buckle up. It's gonna be fun. Mark chapter nine. Let's check this out. Mark chapter nine, verses 14 through 17. From Jesus the demon slayer, what does he have to teach us today? Verse 14, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Isn't that amazing? As soon as Jesus does a supernatural work, as soon as Jesus comes on the scene and heals people and multiplies bread and fish and casts out devils and raises the dead, you know who comes to the scene? Those who are curious and those who are cynical. The religious spirit gets riled up when we talk about this because we would prefer that Christianity has nothing to do with the supernatural. Because as soon as the supernatural rises to the surface, our faith, or lack thereof, is exposed. And let me tell you, the devil is overplaying his hand in this generation. I mean, I see him running rampant everywhere. I see him in the suicide, uh, suicide metrics. I see him in depression. I see him in the amount of pharmaceuticals that people are addicted to. I see him all over the place. You can't hide it anymore. So we as Christians, we need to make the decision today. Are we going to be cynical like the scribes? Or are we going to marvel with childlike faith at the way Jesus operated so that he can train us to do the same work? Who will we be like today? I want to be like one of these childlike faith havers. How would you say that? Childlike faith havers. So you can write in your notes. I'm a childlike faith haver in Jesus' name. So here's what it went on to say. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Now, trust me, I know that we as Christians, we can get kind of weird about this stuff. We're all of a sudden we're looking and it's like there's a devil under every rock. And, you know, you know, Pastor Todd would say like, man, I had a really bad dream last night. It must have been the devil. Or maybe it was all of those tacos you had from Hobby's Tacos. Maybe that's why you had a bad dream. Not everything is demonic. But you know what's interesting about this father's response? It was as if the father had tried every solution for his mute son, and he realized, no, this wasn't a tongue issue. This wasn't a psychological issue or a neurological issue. This wasn't a central nervous system issue. No, this was a spirit. This was a spiritual issue. Here's the first secret I want you to write down. Not every sickness is a physical problem. I want you to think about this. This is what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It talks about Jesus, about God anointing Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. You see, we see throughout Scripture that there are certain physical infirmities. And by the way, I'm not against me medical doctors. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against pharmaceuticals. I'm not against any of that stuff. We see, we see examples in scripture of how God prescribes solutions to people's physical problems with medical needs. I'm not against that. Luke, Luke is a physician for crying out loud. I'm not against doctors, but you know what I am against? I am against trying to solve a spiritual problem with medical needs. And I believe that's what's happening in this generation. I mean, come on now. Depression, suicide rates, anxiety, through the roof. Yet we're the most medicated generation in human history. If this was the solution for every one of these problems, this number would go down. Yet it's going up. Why? Because physical solutions will only compound spiritual problems. You will never solve your spiritual problem with physical means. Doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank account, it's gonna compound the problem you got in your heart. Doesn't matter how many beautiful women you sleep with, it's gonna compound the spiritual issue you have in your heart. We cannot solve spiritual problems with physical means. And let me tell you this, because I prepared this before the context of the storm that we walked through. You can also write this. Not every storm is authored by God. 
Really? I thought he was God of overall creation. Yes, he is, but he also delegates a limited amount of power to Satan himself. I want you to think about this. You can write this in your notes. Job, the story of Job. Remember Job. Job was this righteous man, did everything right. God blessed him abundantly. Richest man in the land of us. He blessed him because of his righteousness. And then Satan comes to God and accuses Job and says, God, the only reason why this guy is worshiping you is because you've blessed him so much. And God says, oh, really? You want to bet? How about this? I'll allow you to touch all of Job's stuff, Satan. Just don't touch him and watch how he will still worship me. So Satan, given this limited amount of authority and power, goes and sends an army to destroy all of, of Job's things, all of his cattle, destroys all of his land, all of his property. And then Job gets a message from a messenger one day that a wind, a mighty wind came through, blew his house down, and, and killed all four of his sons. And to Job's credit, Job falls to his face and said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what I love about Job in that situation is he wasn't offended by God. He, he said this is an opportunity to provide God the most precious form of worship. Worship as a sacrifice. Sacrificial thanksgiving. But here's what's amazing. With the limited perspective that Job had, Job didn't realize this one thing. The storm wasn't from God. The storm was from the devil. And the devil wants us to think that everything that happens in our lives comes from God. Because as soon as we believe that every bad thing, every diagnosis, every wayward child, every spouse that walked out on us, as soon as we think, well, it was a, God is sovereign, how could he allow it to happen? Satan comes into our ear and says, where was God? Don't bite the bait. Don't bite the bait. The devil came with one motive, and it was to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil so that we could have abundant life. Amen? Let's not, let's not put our crosshairs on God. Let's put our crosshairs on the true enemy of our soul. The second secret. Jesus delegated deliverance to his followers. Deliverance. What are we talking about? Deliverance, casting out devils, taking authority over the devil. Because a lot of times we're like, yo, that's crazy. Are we talking about like the exorcist movie? Or is that what it's going to look like? Should I call in a priest? Should I get the holy water and start splashing over the house? Should I have somebody else do it? We're talking about taking authority over the devils that are keeping people bound in addiction, in lust, in stinking thinking, that are dragging people to hell. Jesus did not limit authority over these things to himself or to the pastor on stage. He gave that authority to you. Check this out. This is what it says in Mark chapter 9, verses 18 through 19. And wherever it seizes him, this is the father speaking, it throws him down, meaning this, his son has the spirit, and the spirit is literally trying to destroy his son. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So you might be thinking, oh my gosh, like I... I came to Christianity because I wanted something not weird in my life. Now you're talking about this. Now, let me tell you, God isn't weird. God is a God of order. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is weird. The, de the devil is the author of confusion. So what you're seeing happen here is you're seeing the devil being confronted like a cockroach with the light, and the light makes that devil squirmish. It goes on to say, so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, you foolish father of the mute, uh, mute spirited son, you should have come straight to me. I didn't give my disciples that authority. No, actually, this is what Jesus says. Jesus goes on and answers him and says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So I love Jesus's compassion. Even though his disciples didn't have the faith to do it, Jesus said, I'm gonna get the job done right now. I, oh, I love Jesus. This is what it says in Luke 10, 19. Jesus himself says this 
to his disciples. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Come on, man. This is why I'm so fired up about this. Because we as a church need to understand that the devil isn't just underneath Jesus' feet. The devil isn't just underneath Pastor Todd's feet. The devil is underneath your feet as a blood-bought, Holy Spirit-filled child of the King. You have authority over all the demonic that's going on in the world, in your home, come on somebody, in your workplace, and in the city. We as Christians need to believe it because here's what's happening. It's so wild. It's as if before Jesus comes back, the devil is doing whatever he can to pull out all of the stops to try to, to try to keep people on the wide path that leads to hell. He's doing whatever he can, and he's overplaying his hand. I'll give you some examples. We have some people in our ministry, they do fresh start counseling. So they're counseling people, processing the issues of their heart, going through forgiveness and all that sort of stuff. You know, like for some of you, you might think it's, oh, that's like very mushy gushy and very like, let's get into our feelings. And in the middle of this fresh start counseling session, just a couple weeks ago, someone started manifesting a demon in the middle of that counseling session. So these two fresh start leaders are like, all right, well, here we go. The Bible, go figure, is coming alive before our very eyes. Are we going to get in the game or are we going to run away from what Jesus is inviting us into? Amen. I have another friend who, I uh, <laughs> love this guy. He was in our small group a little while ago uh, sharing this story with us. I'll read for you the text that he sent me. This is, so I'm reading this verbatim. So the grammar's off. Like, forgive me. You can, uh, I won't tell you who he is, so we'll protect this identity. So I asked him about this story. I'm asking him to like retell the story. He said he, his friend, who he was like counseling with, his friend was uh, really struggling. His friend told him that he received a spirit that appeared to him in his room when he was in his early 20s. I want to hit that pretty hard for some people right now because there's some people in this room, you've actually experienced something very similar to that a demonic dark presence in your room at the foot of your bed. I've, my wife has experienced things like that, like crazy mocking spirits at the foot of her bed when she was a child. I've woken up in the middle of the night and have seen things like that. I know that Pastor Mike O'Connell in your old house, remember you have some stories of things like that. The spirit, like these, these demons are intimidators, man. And they are thieves. They don't ask for permission some of you have had very traumatic things happen to you in your upbringing, and it was like when that traumatic thing occurred, whether it was an abuse or something was said to you or someone was taken from you, all of a sudden, like, something entered your life. Some crazy, unshakable depression, unshakable fear, bulimia, anorexia. These are not merely psychological issues. These are spirits with assignments to destroy you. And they look for open doors through trauma and through sin to enter in and take, take control and wreak havoc. But let me tell you, that is all curable because of the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid a high price on that cross 2,000 years ago to set you free. So I don't want you to be freaked out, but I hope that the Holy Spirit is bringing revelation as he's shining a light on what you've walked through and is showing you it's not you. You're not the crazy one. The thoughts going through your head, you're like, these thoughts don't belong to me. You're right, they don't belong to you. They don't belong there, and Jesus wants to evict that buzzard. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you a new mind. He wants to give you power, love, and a sound mind. I declare that over you in the house of God today, that today your portion is to come out of bondage from the devil and to come into peace, the peace of God that surpasses understanding. Because you can't give away to other people what you haven't received for yourself. Receive it now. Say, I receive it in Jesus' name. So he goes on to say in the story, his friend, this happened to him in his early 20s. He just could never feel joy, heard voices to take his own life. He had a gun and was going to do it a week before we had prayed together. He pulled the trigger and it wouldn't go off. Come on. Our God is sovereign even over the devil's tactics. He had gotten a text from his daughter right at that moment. So he knew that God had stepped in. 
He met with me the next day and told me this whole story. And we prayed on this back deck at our house. And by the way, he lives like on a golf course. So people are like, you know, going up and down golfing while they're praying with each other. And so, which is, uh, it's going to get pretty wild. So they start praying and he's like praying and, and, and he says that he wanted to pray to, to receive Christ again. But as soon as they were praying, his friend couldn't even say the name of Jesus. And do you know why? It's because the devil, this is the third secret, the devil trembles at the name of Jesus. As soon as you and I de declare and claim the name of Jesus, every knee under heaven and under the earth must bow to that name. So the devil will do whatever he can to keep people from confessing that Jesus is Lord. And so in this scenario, this guy is like not able to confess Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, his eyes are literally rolling to the back of his head. Like, this is nuts. Like, you think, like, the movies you watch on Netflix are crazy? Like, this is crazy. The Bible and real life is crazy. And you and I get to be a part of the most amazing story on a winning team. And we have nothing to be afraid of. And we have an amazing mission. And let me tell you that the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. And in this moment... My friend, he's like seeing this happen. The guy's eyes are rolling to the back of his head. And he's like, he's got one of two decisions to make. Uh, hey, let's try this again next week. Or hey, you know, here's the address of my church. Want to come hang out on Sunday? Maybe we can get to the bottom of this on Sunday. No, in that moment, he took his authority as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a soldier in God's army. And he said, I don't even know what I'm doing. But he put his hand on this guy and he said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of him. Let's go. And so, yeah, like seriously, he just puts his hand on this guy. Imagine what's going through this guy's head. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before, but I know what Jesus did. I'm just going to do what Jesus did. That's what it means to be a disciple. If we don't see it in the life of Jesus, if it never came out of his mouth, we don't say it. We don't believe it. We don't do it. If we are disciples of Jesus, we look at him as our motto and we say, I'm going to deny myself, pick up my cross and follow you in every way. And so in this moment, he does. The guy gets set free on his deck. And I'm wondering, like, all the golf claps that are happening on the golf course as this is happening. The guy confesses Jesus, is filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment. And now he's on his way, following Jesus, loving Jesus, free from that stuff. It's, like, it's amazing, man. This is like, and I don't want, hey guys, I don't want anyone to kind of like be weird. So like, don't go to first watch after this and say, who needs to be delivered in the name of Jesus? Like, I mean, I'm not telling you not to if a demon manifests, but maybe like just go in a little bit more easy before you start flipping tables, right? But here's, here's the key that I want us to, to recognize. Demons tremble at the authority that you and I have. Sometimes we don't talk about this stuff in church because we're like, that's just kind of weird. You know what I mean? You know what's not, you know what's weird? Not doing what Jesus told us to do. Jesus told us, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. Go preach the gospel to all the nations. Deliverance is not a spiritual gift. What do I mean by that? We know that in the Bible, there's spiritual gifts. Some people are given one gift over another gift. Some people might have the gift of teaching. Some people might have the gift of prophecy. Some have the gift of discerning of spirits or interpreting of tongues or mercy or helps or whatever. But you know what's not mentioned in that list of gifts? Deliverance. Deliverance is not a gift issue. It is a commission issue. It means Jesus told all of his disciples, go and do this work. All of us. All of us. So what does that look like practically? Maybe you won't encounter this week somebody who's like foaming at the mouth, okay? And that'd be awesome because that can be very disruptive to what's going on in our lives unless God wants us to go and to set that person free. But you and I can be proactive and not just reactive, okay? So we can go around our workplaces. We can go around our homes. We can walk around a community that's been devastated by the work of the devil, 
and we can begin taking the authority that Jesus has given us and start declaring words of life. We can start binding the devil and start loosing the power of the Holy Spirit through the words that we declare and the words that we pray. It looks like this, even in this room. Father, I thank you that no devil has authority in this auditorium. I thank you, God, that we are the head and not the tail, that we are blessed going in and blessed coming out, that we are blessed in the city and we are blessed in the field. I thank you, Jesus, that we are more than conquerors through you who love us. I thank you, Jesus, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And even now, God, in faith, in faith, we bind every demonic spirit. We cancel every demonic attack and every demonic agenda against the people here, against our families in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for a hedge of protection over every vehicle. We thank you, God, for a hedge of protection over every home and every bank account. God, we thank you that the victory is yours. We declare it and receive it today in Jesus' name. You see what I'm doing? You might be thinking, wow, you've been, you sound like you've been doing that for a while. Well, let me tell you, childlike faith is all you got to start with. Begin moving in faith and use your tongue to decree and declare and usher in the kingdom of God and take it back from the devil in Jesus' name. The fourth and final secret is the devil knows that he is powerless when we have faith. Our faith in God overcomes the devil. Not faith in yourself, not faith in your prayers, not faith in the books that you've read, faith in God. This is what it says in Mark chapter nine, verses 21 through 29. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked the father of the boy. And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I love that. I love that. I love that. Lord, how do you want to hit that? I wasn't even preparing to say this. Why do we talk about this? Why are we talking about spiritual warfare? It's not so that we can look sweet. It's not so that we can boost up our testosterone and our adrenaline and go and make war against the devil, even though those are side effects that are quite pleasant and actually very fun as you go and do this work. But why do we go and do this work? Because the love of God compels us. When you see somebody who's tried everything, every 12-step program, every pharmaceutical medication, they've read every self-help book, they've gone from partner to partner to partner to partner to partner. And there's no relief. Who are we as the church if we say, oh yeah, I don't know. I guess we've exhausted all of our efforts. Could it be that the linchpin to that person's freedom cannot be pulled by a doctor, by a psychiatrist, by a counselor? Love them. What if that linchpin could only be pulled by a Holy Spirit-filled Christian who believes? What if? This is the type of testimony that the world is crying out for. All of creation groans for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Who are the sons and daughters of God? Those who are led by his spirit and believe. May the compassion of God fill us so that we can be sent to set these people free. Jesus then goes on to ask the father, he says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe sort of. I believe enough for salvation. I believe enough for forgiveness. But I don't believe enough in this moment that the power of God is able to do this. Help me in my unbelief. And let me tell you today, if you're in that place where you've been walking in religion, lifeless, powerless religion for years, and this is stirring something in your heart, you're tired of reading the Bible and just glossing over these sections because you're like, I don't see it happen. I never seen it work. I've only seen it, like, and I've always been cynical about it. And, and when I read it, it actually disconnects me from God 
because I don't believe this, but I'm willing. I'm willing. God, help me in my unbelief that I have this same power today to bring your kingdom down to planet Earth. I want you right now, just in a moment of humility, just close your eyes if that's you. Actually, let's all close our eyes. We all need this. We all need this. Just repeat this simple phrase. Lord, say it with me. Say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Father, I pray right now for your spirit to fall upon these people. I pray, God, that you would fill us right now with a power, with an urgency, with a desire. I pray, God, that we would fall more in love with your word than ever before. We would stop trying to add to it. We would stop trying to skirt around it. We would submit to it and we would say yes and amen to everything that you've given for, to us to accomplish in this age. God, I pray that you would equip your bride right now with faith that you've never left us, you'll never forsake us, and you are sending us on mission to go and set the captives free. I pray, God, that we would have more faith. I want you to lift up your hands right now. I want you to lift up your hands. God, I pray that every person in this auditorium, you would increase our faith when we pray for those who are oppressed, when we pray for those who are bound. We would believe that you are so good and you are so powerful that you would liberate them in that moment. God, would we be a believing church in your power? In Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen like you mean it. Amen. You guys can stand to your feet. As we close, I want to give an opportunity for anybody in this house right now. If you're honest, you've been... you felt the wreckage of the devil for years knowingly or unknowingly serving on his team, serving in his kingdom. But let me tell you, I wanna show you this. This is, this is how that story ends. You see, Jesus in his compassion, Jesus in his compassion sets this man free, sets this man's son free. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, because he was getting evicted. No spirit wants to leave its home that it's been comfortable in for a while. Cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Come on, somebody. I want you to put, yeah, praise God. Praise God, I wanna give you, I wanna give you a powerful picture before we close. So, Put up the, the houses again, please. Just the houses. The boy appeared as one dead. And I want you to think, I want you to think about what these pictures represent in your life spiritually right now. Utter destruction, hopelessness. You could have everything going great on the outside, but on the inside, if you're completely honest, your house is like a whitewashed tomb. You know that you're missing something. You know, that, you know that you were created for more. But let me tell you, Jesus says, rise again. I want you to go to the next picture. When we were picking up all this trash, I heard a woman cry out from the house that we were cleaning up. And I hear her from the distance and she says, oh my gosh, I found it. I found it. You have like dozens of people with chainsaws come around and she's holding up this one diamond ring. She's lost everything. She holds this one diamond ring that she found underneath all of the rubble. And it was as if everything came back into order in her life in that moment. I said, man, man, I grab that ring and just take a picture. Because I said, this is the perfect picture of what Jesus does, of what the Holy Spirit does when he's scavenging through this world of destruction of disease, of decay, of divorce, of hopelessness, of irrecoverable diagnoses. And he looks through all of this world and he says, I'm just looking for my precious ones. Where are my precious ones? And let me tell you, here today, God brought you for a purpose if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're tuning in right now, God brought you to this live stream for a purpose. 
God doesn't look, you, look at you as damaged goods. He looks at you as a precious gem to be found. And let me ask you today, are you willing to be found? Are you willing to be found? Our King Jesus left heaven, left all of glory, all of his inheritance, came down to planet earth 2000 years ago on a rescue mission to find people like you and like me who were stuck underneath this massive cosmic battle that was going on. And he said, no, I didn't come that they might, might die and be condemned, but that they might have life. And I want you just to picture yourself. You're sticking your hand out out of the rubble saying, God, if there is a God in heaven, will you come rescue me? Jesus comes. He doesn't ask you to fight your way out of the rubble. He grabs your hand and he says, follow me. Stop trusting in yourself. Just give up, just yield, surrender, surrender. Stop all the toil. Come to me and ask for forgiveness for your sin. Wide is the path that leads to destruction and the end of it is death for your sin and my sin. But Jesus paid a high price on a cross 2000 years ago, bleeding out for your sin, raising from the grave on the third day by the power of the Holy Spirit, proving that the check cleared he paid your debt in full. And all he's saying is, do you believe? Do you trust me? If there's someone in this place today that says, I'm done trusting in myself, I wanna stop being a prisoner of war on the devil's team. I wanna come to King Jesus. I wanna receive forgiveness. I wanna receive a new life. I wanna become a new creation. I wanna be given new desires, a new appetite for righteousness. I'm done living for the devil. I wanna live for the King of glory. If there's anybody in this place that is ready to receive that forgiveness, I want you to come forward as the band plays. Band's gonna play in the background a little bit. You come forward to the front here. I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer to connect you with your Father in heaven. So church, be praying for those people. If that's you, come forward right now. I wanna lead you in that prayer.